Hello and welcome back to this uh, ninth lecture of CCNA2 version 6 Routing and Switching Essentials with me, Joachim Kjellerstad from the University of Skövde. And what we're going to explore in this uh, almost last lecture is network address translation. Uh, and before we begin, I just want to tell you that this is something that I see that students usually have problems with, so make sure that you go through this this lecture with care and that you really grasp uh, how this protocol works and what it does. So what we're going to do is that we're going to explore what network address translation or NAT is, how we need, why we need it, how it works, how we configure it, and how we do some troubleshooting. And there's going to be quite a few practicals. So uh, this is one of the longer lectures I expect. And do go through it carefully and make sure that you understand what, what this stuff is, because it's a really important con uh, concept with an IPv4 networking. And it's, uh, for some reason, a little bit troublesome for students uh, is what I've seen before, at least. So the issue, or why do we need NAT, is because we have an issue with IPv4 addresses. And as you know, the issue is that we are out. And to be able to use IPv4 networks anyway, we have divided the IPv4 address span, or it was actually divided before, into these private and public IP addresses. and. Uh, what we want to do is to use IPv4 addresses inside a local area network and then have all devices inside that local area network share one or more public IP addresses when they're communicating with the internet. And this is what NAT enables us to do. And as such, it conserves IP addresses and it also adds some degree of security to the internal network as it masks what internal IP or private IP address a device actually uses. So let's look at an example here where we have uh, our router 2. And let's, let me get a laser pointer. Uh, so we have our router 2 right here. And we have our internal networks that are using private address spaces. And whenever any one of the devices in these networks want to communicate with the outside world, then it's going to get a public IP address from router 2 that it can use as long as it needs to communicate. And the good thing with this is that it doesn't have to use it anymore than someone else can use it. So we can use much fewer public IP addresses. So Moving on, we're going to discuss some terminology that we need to do, to do this. Uh, so now we're looking at uh, another picture where we have one inside network in this area and an outside network in this area. So what happens here is that our inside PC wants to communicate with the web server. So the inside IP or the IP address that is configured for PC1 is 192.168.10.10. And that is a private IP address that is not routable. Uh, but the address of the router or an, an address that a router is configured to lend to clients inside the private network is uh, 209.165.200.226 that is a public, public and routable IP address. So what's going to happen is that the client initiates communication saying that, hey, I want to communicate with a web server that's on the address of 192. Uh, two, 209.165.201.1. So it's going to send along the package and it's going to the local router, which is router 2. And what router do, 2 is going to do, it's going to look at the IP package and then it's going to rewrite the source address into a public address that it lends to PC1. So it's going to rewrite the package so it has a source address of 2. 109.165.200.226 and send a package along the way. It's going to the ISP, it's being routed towards the web server. The web server says, okay, nice, and sends a return package, and it's going to address that package to uh, this uh, public address that PC1 landed from router 2. So it's sending it back to router 2, and router 2 is going to keep track of which device currently used this address, so it knows that the return traffic from the web server is going back to PC1. So there is some terminology here that we need to know about. So looking from the point of view of PC1, when it sends the package, it sends it with a source address and a destination address. So the source address will be the inside local address. And the inside local address is the actual address of PC1. So that's 192.168.10.10. The destination address is going to be the outside local address, which is the actual address of the web server, 209.165.201.1. So 
when we are inside our networks, the addresses used inside the networks are called inside local and outside local addresses. So it's the local addresses. When we go out the network, we're going to have global addresses. So we're going to have one inside global address, which is the source address for the package uh, when it's rewritten by router two. The inside global address is the currently used public address uh, assigned to PC one. So that's going to be 209.165.200.226. The outside global address stays the same, uh, and that's still the destination address. So this within local and global addresses, that's an important concept, so make sure that you grasp it. Let's look at another picture. So as we said, the return traffic from web server is going to be addressed to this outside global address. But looking at it, uh, uh, or this inside global address, and looking at it from the point of view of the web server, it's going to address the package back to 209.165.200.226 being the glo inside global address, the global address of the inside host. And what's going to happen is that router2 is going to maintain a net table where it knows what device is currently using the uh, this global address. So it knows that it's going to send the traffic back to uh, PC1. So now that we know this with uh, inside local, outside local, and inside global, outside global addresses, the next thing we're going to do is look at some different types of NAT because there are actually a few. So we have static NAT, which is the example that we've seen when we have static, NAT, uh, uh, static address mappings that are one to one. So what we configure here in the router is just saying, well, this private IP address is using this public IP address. Uh, so this is useful in cases where we have internal network, uh, internal private networks, but we may have a server or something that needs to have a static mapping to a public IP address. There is also dynamic NAT, where we do many-to-many -many mappings, and those are based on demands. So what we do, uh, or, or are based on demand. So what we do here is that we configure an inside network, and we say that any device in this network may use any of these publicly uh, public addresses, and then mappings are made on demand. So if we have three public addresses, then three private devices can configure can communicate with internet uh, at the same time and if we're out of public addresses well then no one else can communicate and then we also have the port address translation which is a many to one mapping and this allows many hosts to use one pu public id uh, ip address and we're going to explore how that works this is also called nat overloading so let's look at this in a little bit more detail so if we have this uh, if we have this static NAT, we do one-to-one -one mappings. So what we configure in the router is that we say, like in the example here, we say that server one with a private IP address of 192.168.10.10 is going to use the outside address or the public address of uh, 209.165.200.226. So the private ID is IP is the inside local address and the public IP is the inside global address, and it's going to be reachable to router two. The good thing here is that we can have bidirectional communication because router two will know that if anyone on the internet is ac accessing one of the inside global addresses, then it's going to know what private address to forward it to. So then we have this dynamic NAT. With dynamic NAT, we instead configure this network as devices that can use NAT, and then we configure a bunch of global addresses. So uh, then we have this table of inside global addresses, publicly uh, routable addresses, and what happens then is that whenever device, like in this case, uh, the PC3 is accessing the internet, it gets it get, gets one of the available public addresses for a while or for the duration of the communication and it can communicate, but then when it doesn't need to communicate anymore, it leaves the, uh, it leaves the address for someone else to use. So here we have the drawback of bidirectional communication being a little bit troublesome because well, while router two will maintain knowledge about this translation for a little while to allow return traffic, whenever communication is initiated from outside the internet, we get in trouble because router two won't know which uh, internal address that is uh, that is the actual destination of a package because it's, it won't be those mappings mappings are dynamic. So looking at port address translation or PAT, which is the short, 
What happens here is that one router can be configured using one uh, one global address. So we only have one inside global address, one uh, public address that is routable, in this case uh, 209.165.200.22 and 6. And what's going to happen whenever a device, like in this case, wants to communicate with the outside world is that router 2 will not only associate the inside IP address with the public IP address, it's also going to apply a port number as you see here. So it can actually maintain a long list of uh, of different uh, inside addresses that is using the global IP address. So in this case, PC1 and PC2 are communicating with two different servers on the inside, uh, on, on the outside network. And as you can see in the, uh, in the NAT table, what happens is that we have two devices using the same inside global IP address, that is the uh, address that router 2 assigned to them but you can see that it's appending a port number which will be different for the two devices and thus the router is able to keep track of multiple uh, NAT uh, uh, of multiple NAT instances at once. So let's do a practical examination of this before we move on. So let's go, let's head to Packet Tracer. So okay, this was a large topology. Let's see if we can zoom down a little bit. Okay, I'm not sure how well you see this, but what we have here is actually uh, some internet and we have a bunch of different networks. So let's see what we're going to look at in the activity. First, we have to wait for the network to converge, apparently, so we fast forward time a little bit. So what we're going to do now is generate an HTTP request from any PC in, in the central domain. So this is the central domain. So we generate a HTTP request by just clicking any PC and then we go to desktop and the web browser. And what we're going to browse to was branch server.pka. So let's copy that and go. So now we're gonna switch to So what we're going to do now is that we're going to look at one of the routers. So let's look at router 2 and I just want to show you this in action here. So let's go enable Cisco class um, configuration terminal and do show IP NAT translation. And you can see here that when we did this, there is a bunch of translations going on. So this is NAT in action. So whenever this host, which is on the 1010 10 network is communicating with the outside world, what is happening is that it does get a outside global address that is routable and it's in the 64 network. So that's what I wanted to show you for this for this little demonstration, how it works in practice. We're going to build it later and look more on the different types of NAT. So let's head back to the theory um, and look at the pros and cons of using NAT. So on the good side, we have that it we get the chance to conserve the legal, legally registered addressing scheme. So this allows us to have more hosts working on the same private I, uh, public IP address. It also increases the flexibility of connections to the public network because, well, we can just add and remove hosts within those networks that can use uh, that can use. Uh, NAT, we can also have an easier way to have consistency for our internal network addressing schemes because when you buy net IP addresses, you would first buy one block and then you may need more addresses and you get a totally different block. Now we have our, our few uh, public addresses available that we use with NAT and we can do use any private IP addresses we want. We also get some network security because as you see, seen in the picture, the outside hosts are not aware of the IP actual private IP of the inside hosts, so they don't really know who they're communicating with. On the bad downside, the performance is degraded to a degree because the router has to keep track of these net tables and perform, perform those, <coughs> those translations, which is a little bit resource intense. We also get some problems with end-to-end -end functionality and traceability, and that's both a pro and a con, of course, but with IP telephony and other technologies, you really want this end-to-end -end connectivity and traceability, so that's an issue. Uh, also, you get some um, more com complications when you want to do tunnels, which we will explore in a later course, and also initiating TCP connections uh, can be disrupted because of these uh, these end-to-end -end connectivity and traceability being lost.
So let's look at how we configure. So configuring static NAT, that is quite simple. So if we have a static NAT example, what we want to do is that we want to configure static NAT so that whenever the web server on the inside network is communicating with the outside network, there's going to be a static NAT translation. So what we do then is basically that we use the command that is IP NAT inside source static. So that says do static NAT and then we configure the inside local address and the outside local address. So basically with this command we say inside uh, IP NAT inside source static we want to have static NAT and we want the IP address 192.168.11.99 to use this outside address which is 209.165.201.5. So this is going to create a static mapping uh, meaning that whenever the web server is accessing the internet, it will be using the, the outside address to, uh, 209 something something. And then whenever someone is accessing 209.165.201.5, the traffic will come to router 2 and then be rerouted to the web server. When we did this mapping, we also have to configure inside and outside interfaces. So we do that by going to the interface configuration mode and do IP NAT inside or IP NAT outside. And the inside interface is, of course, the interface that is in the inside network and the outside interface is the network that's in the outside network. So that's it for static NAT. Quite simple so far, right? But I'm promising you things will be a little bit more, uh, more cumbersome in a little while. But before we do that, let's look at how we can uh, verify this static NAT uh, translation. So. Uh, the static NAT translation or configuration will always be present in the NAT table and when it's not being used it will look as in the top picture here. So this is the static, uh, the static mapping where we currently only have an inside global and local address. Uh, so this will reflect the uh, inside private IP and the outside global uh, public IP that is used when communicating with the internet. And we ha when we have an ongoing uh, session, we also see the outside local and global addresses, which is uh, which are usually the same, at least for uh, for what we care about in this course. So that's it for static NAT. Quite simple, right? Let's move on to dynamic NAT. So in dynamic NAT, we have this many-to-many -many mapping. So what we want to configure on router two here is that we want to say that any of these devices can communicate. Uh, with the internet using uh, a number of uh, a number of devices uh, or a number of IP addresses. So what we need to do in order to do that is that we have to create a NAT pool and then we have to create an access list. So the NAT pool uh, is much like DH a DHCP pool. It's a pool of public addresses that can be used when communicating with the outside network. The access list that we configure, that's an access list that is describing what inside hosts that are allowed to use NAT. So then we have to bind the NAT pool with the ACL. So what we do in this case is that we do IP NAT inside source list because in this case the source isn't static the source isn't list or access list so we do ip net inside source list one in this case and one is a permit list that covers those two networks because it's a 192.168.0.0 with a wildcard mask of 00255255 so it will uh, it will cover any network or any device with an ip beginning with 192.168 and then we have pool and the pool that we created. So in this case, we did a IP NAT pool to create a pool. We assigned a name, and then we just have to supply a range of addresses using the starting IP, the ending IP, and the net mask. Uh, that those IP address that belongs to the network that these, these IP addresses is in. So what we do is then IP NAT inside source list one and the pool that we have created. Then again, uh, IP NAT inside uh, on the interface for the inside network and IP NAT outside for the interface with the outside network. So that is it for dynamic uh, configuration of dynamic NAT. And looking at IP NAT statistics, you can actually see what NAT pool you use, you can see what access list you use, you can see the outside and inside interfaces, and you can see how many active translations there are. So instead of using just use IP net tr translations, you can also use statistics to see that it actually works. So the final thing that we can configure then is port address translation, which is 
quite simple actually. What you do is that you begin again with creating a standard access, uh, a standard access list that permits what addresses that should be translated. Uh, and you do that with the access list command. And then you establish the dynamic source translation by just specifying the ACL and the outside, uh, the exit interface. So in this case, you do IPNAT inside source list. Uh, but instead of doing this pool thingy, you do an interface number and you, you, you type interface and specify the interface and then you do overload. And overload, that's this keyword to enable port address translation. Uh, so then we do the IP NAT inside and IP NAT outside again, and that is it for uh, port address trans translation. Now let's do a practical before we move on. So let's get going in Packet Tracer. So what we're going to do here is first we're going to configure router 2. So And what we're going to do is that we're going to configure router 2 to use dynamic NAT with port address, address translation so that whatever a device in any of the three networks uh, connected here to local PKA, here to PC1 or here to PC3, whenever any device in those networks are communicating with the internet, then and port address translation should be used. So let's head right on to router 2 and do the steps. So we go enable and then we go configure terminal. And what we're going to do first is that we're going to create a standard ACL um, that permits a permit list for all of those networks. So we're going to do it the easy way. So we go um, access list, uh, we just call it number one. And then we do a permit statement and we do 192.168.0.0.255.255 to cover all those networks. So that's an access list that will allow communication from any one of those networks. And what we're going to use it for is to allow them to use our NAT. Next thing we want to do is do a NAT pool. So do, we do IP NAT and then we're going to do a pool. So in this case, we need a name for the pool and let's just call it R2, R2 pool. And then as you see here, we're going to have the start IP address. In this case, we're only going to use the 209.165.202.129 address. And so we go do that and then we're going to have the same end IP address because we're only going to use one. So we do 209. Dot one six five dot two oh two dot one two nine and then we're going to sub supply the subnet mask for this and this is a slash thirty network so the subnet mask will be two five five two five five two five five two five two and that is it this is how we create a NAT pool if we sub supply a mask here. So what did I did do wrong? net mask time to wake up those brain cells so now we did the access control list that allow that dictates what addresses that are you going to use our net uh, our net and then we also did a net pool with only one address so now we're going to bind those together with by uh, so that whenever any of these IP addresses are communicated with the internet they're going to use this 209.165.202.129 address. So the way we do that is by we by doing IP NAT inside spelling is not my strong suit today. IP NAT inside source list right because we are we are defining the source addresses the inside local addresses with a source list which we numbered as one. Then we're going to specify the pool of addresses that we did. So we did pool and we did R2 pool. So that is basically it if we want to use dynamic NAT only, but now we want to do overload. So we do overload as well. So what we did now was that we configure dynamic NAT with, um, with port address, tr address translation. So the final thing is that we have to identify the inside interfaces and do this IP NAT inside, and then we have to do the IP NAT, NAT outside as well. So we have serial 101, serial 100, and then we have some false Ethernet link here, false Ethernet 00. So we have to go into each and every one of them, beginning with interface serial 
one, spelling is bad again. And we do IP NAT inside, because this is an in inside interface. Then we go serial, zero, zero, zero. Again, IP NAT inside. And then we go IP, uh, go in internet, fast ethernet, zero, zero. And again, IP NAT inside. And then for this, for the final thing that we need to do is go to this interface. Let's just look it up, look it up and okay, there's no table. That would have been too easy. Okay, so let's do uh, do show IP interface brief. So we can see what interface has this address beginning with 209 and it's serial 010. So then we go serial interface serial 010 and we do IP NAT outside because this is the outside interface. So now if we do an end and we go show IP NAT translations, IP NAT tran show IP NAT translations, we have none. But if we do some pinging around, so we ping from PC1 to PC4, and from PC PC3 to PC4. So now if we do the show IP net translations again, we see that we have some active, uh, some active, uh, some active net translations here. So the first one is a little bit hard to, to read, but if we look at the first one here, uh, at the second one here, we can see that we have the inside local address of 192.168.10.10. Uh, and the above is actually, I think, 192.168.30.10. So we have the two different pings. And then we see that we are using the same inside global address, the one that we configured, but we appended a port number here to differentiate between the two. So I actually do want to show you something here. Uh, so if we do uh, configure terminal, uh, what I want to show do here is to remove the NAT command and redo it. So we do uh, no IP NAT inside source list one is that oh, nope um okay so it's in use so i can't remove it can we do clear ip net translations to remove the translations star so now there are none so we can go again configuration terminal and remove the uh, and remove the natural so what i wanted to do was to again uh, do the same NAT, but without overload, just to show you dynamic NAT. Show, uh, so inside uh, IP NAT inside source list one, which is the access control list with allowing the hosts within our networks. Uh, pool, R2, pool. And now I don't do overload and the inside commands are still there. So what I wanted to show you here is that what happens if we ping from PC1 to PC4 and from PC3 to PC2 is that you see that the ping here from PC3 to PC4, it fails. And that is because when we do a do show IP net tr translation, we can only have one going at the same time. And that is because we didn't use this, uh, we didn't use paths and we didn't, um, by not supplying uh, the overload. So let's again go do clear IP net trans and star. And what I want to do now is remove this rule again. And I'm going to show you another way of configuring uh, NAT with uh, uh, NAT with pat, pat address, uh, port address translation. So one thing that we can do instead of using this NAT pool, we can just supply an exit interface and go overload. So we do that if we do IP NAT again inside source list one. That's uh, list. That is our list of allowed IP addresses. But in this case, we go into face and we go serial 010 overload. So now he's showing you in practice that we can ping again. Successful, successful. And if we go uh, do show IP net translations, you see that we have those translations again. Now it's to another IP address. And the, now the inside global IP address is actually the IP address used by the router on this interface. So that's another way that you can do it. 
uh, without having to supply the port. And, and that, this is actually quite a common way to do it if you have only one address for uh, only one public address. So the last thing that we're going to do is that we also want the web server or the local PKA here to be accessible from PC4. And now it isn't because the thing is that if we go to PC4 and we do uh, and we do a local dot p, uh, pka, we won't get anywhere. So also, if I remove all those and ping from PC4 to local pka, it fails because local pka has a non uh, an outside address or an inside address, a private IP address that is not routable. So we have to make a static mapping between the inside and outside address. So the way we do that is that we head back to configuration terminal. And what we're going to do now is that we're going to do uh, a static NAT, which is IP NAT inside source still. But in this case, we do static. So first we supply the inside local address. So the inside local address is going to be 192.168.20.1. So that's the inside local address, the private IP address of local.pka. And then if we go the question mark, the next thing we want to do is the inside global IP address, which is the outside IP address, the public IP address that should belong to local PKA. So that is 209.165.202.1. And if you do a question mark, you realize that it, this is it. So if we hit enter now, then we can start by doing a do show IP NAT translation. And you can see that the translation is in use here or is active here. So now if PC4, I think we actually have to do this with a command prompt. If PC4 tries to ping uh, this outside global address or outside local address, 209.165. 202.1.30. It's actually going to work is if Cisco configure routing and everything correctly. Request timeout because of the ARP, and then you see that it works. And if we go into router two and we do the show IP net translation again, you cannot see that now it's actually having active translations for the ping messages. So that is everything working as intended. Let's head back to the theory and look on a few other things concerning net, net, uh, network address translations. So the next thing that I want to tell you about to sort of fine tune what we just did with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the static mapping is port forwarding. So port forwarding is forwarding traffic to a single port to a specific address. So what we did now with the static NAT is that we conf uh, configured the router to forward all traffic to a specific public IP address to the, to the server. But if we have different servers or if we have even one single web server, what we want to do is that we actually just want to have a filter saying that, well, we should only forward traffic on port 80 if it's a web server or port 20 and 21 if it's, if it's an FTP server. So this would provide an additional layer of security. So the idea here is that we have a case where we have one single private IP on our router and we want traffic sent to that router on port 80 to be forwarded to a web server with a private IP address. So that's basically the case. So port forwarding can do this. And how we configure this is that we apply port numbers in our static NAT command. So the command is IP NAT inside source static, and then we do TCP, the inside, global ad inside local address, port 80, and the outside global address and the port number. So the example here is that every traffic coming to the router or coming to the IP address 209.165.200.225 200, on port 80 is going to be routed to the inside local address 192.168.10.254 on port 80. And then we do the inside outside commands. So that is basically it. Uh, let's have a few words on NAT for IPv6 before we end. And you should know that NAT is not needed in IPv6 in the same way uh, as IPv4 because we basically have addresses to spare. I guess some calculations said that it, there are more IPv6 addresses than there are uh, sand in Sahara or bacteria in the world or something like that. So there are loads of IPv6. 
Uh, however, there is a technique that is called NAT64 or NAT4 IPv6, but what that is is actually a migration technique that allows you to translate internal IPv6 addresses to outside IPv4 addresses when you need an IPv4 address for connectivity with the internet, because not all of the internet supports IPv4. Um, some were not NAT troubleshooting, so what we did was that we do, did show IP NAT translations and not IP NAT statistics to uh, translations will show, show active translations and, show, and statistics will show an overview of the NAT configuration as well as some useful statistics. You can also do debug IP NAT to show what happens in real time. So as you see here in the output from debug IP NAT, the output that you get to your console is actually uh, the translations as they happen. And I also want to end with some common errors. And so common errors within NAT, that is wrong configuration of inside outside interfaces. That is very common, but just keep track of that your private IP network, that is your inside address or your inside interface and the outside uh, interface is where packets go when they wanna go out on the internet. Another common mistake is just making the access list that we use to decide what inside hosts that are allowed to use NAT. Uh, we just make mistakes and then things are not going to work as, uh, as we expect. Another one is to forget the overload keyword when using PAT. Uh, also, it's quite common that we have ACL somewhere in the network that interrupts the NAT process. So just make sure that you don't do, do, do those mistakes and remember this list of mistakes whenever you have to troubleshoot your NAT implementation. So with that said, let's end on a practical no note before we move on to the final lecture of this course. So we're in Packet Tracer again and what I decided to do for this practical is just that we're going to look at this uh, uh, we're going to look at this port address or uh, this port forwarding and we're going to use the same topology as we used in in the last case but what we're going to do is that we're going to configure uh, configure it so that there is a mapping between there is a mapping saying that whenever someone is accessing this outside address of local.pka it's going to get to the web server instance so what i have to do first is show you that we just have to go into the local pka and then we're going to make sure that the web server is on uh, and now that it is on, let's first configure the static NAT again. So let's go to the CLI and we do enable and we do a configure terminal. And then we just do our IP NAT inside source static and we configure the inside local address 192.168.20 and 254. And then the outside local address, which is the outside address that local PK it's going to be able to use. So that's 209, 165, 202, 130. And then we're going to configure the inside and outside uh, interfaces. So first we go interface, false Ethernet 00, zero the interface in down here, which is going to be IP NAT, NAT inside. And then we head over to the serial interface here, which is going to be IP NAT outside. So we go interface, serial zero one zero and we do IP net outside. So the effect now is that if we go to this uh, PC here and we go to the desktop and open up a web browser, if we type in the IP address up here, 209.165.202.130, we should access local PKA, which is all good. But we can also ping from PC4 to local P, uh, local PKA. Or apparently we can because I can't because something appears to be in the way. Ah, sorry, I'm forgetting some shortcomings of the of the ping. When I send a PDU, it's going, it's trying to send it to the actual IP address configured with local PKA, which is the private address, which of course doesn't work. So what we have to do is go to the command prompt and do a ping. So we ping the address and then you see that it works. So uh, the problem here is that we only want local PKA to be access accessible on port 80. We don't want it to be accessible using pings or whatever, because that is something that can be used to a, by a hacker to figure to attack our machine. So we want to apply some security here. So what we do is that we go to router two and we just go remove this old natural. So we take up the command and then we just put no in front. 
So now there is no translation. And then what we do is that we go IP NAT inside source static. And in this case, we go TCP and then the IP address, which is 192.168.20.254, the inside local address. But we also supply the port number, which is going to be 80. And then we do the outside address. So the outside address is 209.165.202.130. And then again, the port number. So what we did now by adding TCP and port numbers after each and every one of the IP addresses is that we prohibited other traffic than port 80 traffic to use this. So if we go back and try to do the ping, it's going to fail because there is no translation for this uh, for this IP address that allows a ping. But if we go into the web browser and we type down the IP address, you can see that it still works. So this is static NAT with port forwarding or just port forwarding, forwarding for short. And that is going to end this practical and also this lecture. When we get back, we're going to do a lecture that is quite boring in all honesty, but it's the ending lecture of this course. So make sure you take it so that you can finish your uh, finish your CCNA2 course. So thanks for this and goodbye.